What is aging? Is it possible for us to affect it? How much more can we do? These are big questions. They're going to take us to answers that are going to be illuminating to mankind as a whole. Aging has become a hot topic. We are right now at a point where we can already develop strategies. Injections, stimulation methods, personal programs, pills. We're in the midst of a seismic shift that will open up possibilities for more healthy aging. There is something in the air and we can feel it. And plenty of people who already show you gold nuggets, you know, and say, there's gold here, you know. <laughs> Right now, we're seeing a huge gold rush. Once the proof of concept is established in longevity, it will go viral. The person who will live to 150 has probably already been born. It's highly likely. I'm 15 right now. How old do I think I will be? I think that, you know, I do want to live a full and healthy life. So I think whatever number I can live until at that time, that guarantees me to have a very healthy life. I love that number. Yeah, I go to bed early, I wake up early just because this is important for my health to do this, so I do it. So it's really good to be consistent in your sleep schedule. It's easy for me to be consistent with waking up at five because it's sort of some nice quiet time. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's so I, I do it's that out of consistency because that's a really important thing for your circadian rhythms, so yeah. Nina Kara first became interested in longevity research when she was 12. Now the teenager is one of the scene's rising stars. Nina stands for a generation that takes a new view of aging, that wants to see aging eradicated. When she's not in school, Nina holds talks around the world. She's launched a small startup with a couple of friends. The group searches for scientific clues on how to crack the aging code. Yeah. Yeah, I can work on that side. One of our proteins is probably involved with that process in some way. So we could weigh how much that protein is involved in that process and try to give an estimate, even if we're not adding a whole new protein involved with that process. Yeah, I think that definitely is something that we could, that's useful to measure. My grandfather did have a form of dementia. That was, you know, a big problem, and I wanted to do something about that. One in six women get dementia after the age of 65, and um, one in 10 men, which is a lot of people when you think about it, right? It's these diseases that you previously thought were inevitable, so we thought maybe we'd have drugs to alleviate the pain or to stop one particular type of disease from occurring, but never sort of to, you know, look at the root cause of these diseases and tackle it from there. Each animal species has, in certain ways, an expiration date. In a mouse, it's less than five years. In the bowhead whale, it's 211 years. In humans, it's 122. Each species has a time that's kind of allocated to it. And the question is, why is that? In nature, death is a normal part of life. But can we humans push this biological age limit? Human life expectancy has risen steadily in recent history. 
Back in ancient Rome, it was just 25 years. By the Middle Ages, it was still only 35. Now, we live into our 70s on average. Medical advances and better living conditions are enabling us to get older and older. But can we extend our lifespan indefinitely? And would we really want to? Lots of people want to live forever, and they wonder if we can reverse or slow down the aging process. History tells us so much about violence, death and dying, but it also touches on reincarnation and life. It's a hugely popular theme. Immortality is a topic that will never die. In Germany, there's a famous painting, The Fountain of Youth, and on the painting you see all the old men and women particularly taking their clothes off and getting into the Fountain of Youth and swimming across to the other side and emerging young and healthy on the other side and then going off to the tents and dressing and then having a wonderful dinner together with plenty of wine. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's man's age-old dream to be able to reverse aging. This fountain of youth has become an allegory in biomedical research. It's no longer just about eating a healthy diet and leading a balanced lifestyle. We want to make more serious adjustments. We can take pills or get injections and so on, and we'll end up living longer. The idea of the fountain of youth that's outside me, that I can jump into, has shifted to a fountain that's put inside me, injected into me. We are closer to finding the fountain of youth than ever before. But what if aging were a kind of program, a program we could hack into? An initial clue as to how humans might be reprogrammed leads to an unassuming setting in Central America. I've lived in Costa Rica since 1972 and just completely fell in love with Costa Rica. The peninsula of Nicoya is a place where people age very well and long. I, I think about it all the time. I think about it all the time because it's really mysterious and um, they themselves cannot give you any clues as to why. You ask them and they say, I have no idea. It just is what it is. But yet we are more curious and we want to know more. Anna Gail Glenn takes care of some of the region's centenarians. The residents of Costa Rica's Nicoya Peninsula not only live longer, but stay healthy for longer too. Neri Socorro is 91. People here often live to be over 90, many to over 100. These are herbs you use to heal diseases? That's right. Lots of people around the world want to know how to live a long and healthy life. What's your advice? <laughs> Live for many years, eat a healthy diet, and lead a peaceful, stress-free life. Eggs, lots of vitamins, cheese. When a person eats lots of cheese, their heart won't suffer. This area 
was very, very distantly removed from the mainland, so to speak. It's a peninsula, it's still connected, but our roads were bad. Communication didn't exist. People survived here on what they planted, on what their parents taught them how to survive. There was no pharmacy to go to. That smells so good. This herb treats fever and all kinds of things. Mm. The fact that people in Nicoya live to be older than average went largely unnoticed until one scientist stumbled onto some unusual data some years ago. I was initially an economist, but it never really felt like the right field for me. Eventually, I found my niche in demographics. It's much more precise, with clear-cut rules. It's black and white. By sheer coincidence, we discovered that mortality rates in the region were much lower than the rest of the country. Initially, I didn't pay much attention to it. When I presented my findings at a conference, there was a lot of skepticism about whether it was really so. But one person from the audience approached me afterwards and said, it's because it's a blue zone. And at that moment, I realized that Nicoya really was a special place. Five so-called blue zones have been identified so far on our planet. These are locations where an unusually high percentage of the population lives very long. Men in Nicoya have the world's highest life expectancy. An 80-year-old male here is likely to outlive his contemporaries elsewhere by an average 8.2 years. <laughs> but why? Is it the diet rich in fruit in Nicoya, or does religious faith explain it? There wasn't any real data. The question is, is it genetics or is it lifestyle? People in Costa Rica say, Pura Vida, Pura Vida. We carried out a study to see what happens when people leave Nicoya and what happens when people from other parts of the country move to Nicoya. We found out that neither of these groups achieved the same longevity as those who are born and spend their whole lives here. In blue zones, Aging seems to proceed more slowly. The environment and the lifestyle appear to positively impact human biology. But how exactly? And will this help us crack the aging code? I'm a molecular biologist, biochemist. I'm interested in understanding the origin of diseases. The majority of diseases are those associated to the aging process. So I'm interested in understanding why we age at the molecular level. I wanted to devote my life to understand the origins of cancer and aging. And I thought telomeres could be the key. The human body consists of around 37 trillion cells. Some last a few days, others live for years. We constantly produce new cells to replace the old ones. It's a process that involves duplication. Before cell division can take place, the chromosomes in the cell nucleus have to be duplicated. The DNA double helix they consist of is unwound and separated into strands. Each strand then becomes a template for a new one. 
the ends of the chromosomes, which are especially prone to replication errors, are protected by telomeres, which are sequences of non-coding DNA. But with every cell division, these safety caps become shorter. Charged. <laughs> I feel charged. What's that? <laughs> no? Is that shoe? Oh, the telomeres. <laughs> Imagine this uh, shoelace is our chromosome. So this part of the shoelace is the DNA, where the genetic information is. And this little plastic part, which is very important to protect the shoelace, would be the telomere. So the telomeres are very important to protect our chromosomes, to protect the DNA. As we age, the telomeres become shorter and shorter. This is because every time that we have a damage, the cells have to multiply to regenerate the damage, and this shortens the telomeres, the, the cell division, the cell multiplication. So at the end, the telomeres become so short that we don't have any more a telomere. So now our DNA is unprotected, and this is leading to aging, it's leading to disease, and ultimately will be leading to death. Cell division and the rate of telomere shortening may be influenced by our lifestyle. Smoking, stress, environmental pollutants, and poor nutrition are all negative factors. Some researchers believe living in harmony with the natural world has a positive effect. We couldn't carry out experiments like this in Costa Rica, so we sent our samples away. When the results of this collaboration came back, we realized we'd found something. People from Nicoya have longer telomeres, significantly longer telomeres than people in the rest of the country. Scientists like Maria Blasco are exploring ways of artificially lengthening telomeres in order to slow the aging process. But this does come at a risk. The danger is that cancer can develop, because cancer cells are immortal. And we're walking a fine line here. Do we tell the cells to resist their pre-programmed cell death and risk that it will result in cancer? Or do we leave things to run their natural course and let the cells die when their time is up? And there's no proliferation, and we just accept that our final destination is around 120 to 125 years. But of course, we all know the answer. Humans want to test the boundaries and see if they can really live to 150 or 300. How far can we go? How much should science interfere in nature's blueprint? We don't have to necessarily accept current biological limitation, because that's what we do as a species. We're problem solvers. We don't just sit around and get rained on. We build houses. So we may want to transcend normal biology at some point and set goals for ourselves beyond just normal concepts of health. wonder about what is aging, you end up asking how tissues repair. This is a process that is still poorly understood. Cells progressively accumulate damage, they age, but when they reach a certain threshold, they undergo a switch, they become senescent. I like to describe them as zombies because, you know, they're like in a middle state between alive and dead. They're not either, but they're at the same time, they're really damaging. Senescent cells produce an alarm signal so that the other cells in the body realize that there is a damage there and they go and they repair. The problem is that as we get old, 
these repair cells, they are also old and they don't go and they don't repair. And, and we accumulate these cells that are constantly producing this alarm. This is a phenomenon that is called inflammaging. Old people have inflammatory signals elevated caused by their own senescent cells that are not eliminated. We are trying to crack the code of these senescent cells, trying to understand the vulnerabilities, how to kill them without killing the non-senescent cells. In some initial experiments, Manuel Serrano and his team were able to show that mice lived longer once their senescent, or zombie, cells were eliminated. But that does not guarantee eternal youth. It's a double-edged sword. Senescent cells play also a very good and important role. For example, in wound healing, if you have a wound, if you don't have senescence, the wound will never heal. So you could have a treatment that removes all senescent cells, and suddenly you have terrible side effects. It just means we need more research, you know. Research into telomeres and zombie cells are only two approaches in the race for longevity. And one thing is certain, whoever cracks the code is set to earn millions. All right. So guys, how do I look? Damn, I look old. <laughs> So you've seen what we did. We've announced a $255 million raise. It's the largest raise in our industry to date. Hong Kong has the highest life expectancy on the planet today, which is no surprise because longevity is very often correlated with wealth and uh, here people are filthy rich. <laughs> Welfare is increasing dramatically in the region. In China and mainland, people who were peasants just 35 years ago, they are now multi-millionaires, and people demand longevity. As a CEO of a biotech company, I try to collaborate with a lot of people and I try to contribute to as many projects as possible. Life Clinic is a very fun concept where the founders decided to bridge the Starbucks concept with preventative medical care. You choose a cocktail of all kinds of nutrients that will be going into your blood while you are sipping on a juice. They offer IV drips and all kinds of other interventions. I cannot vouch for some of them. <laughs> Men, yep. IV, Correct. Correct. In Hong Kong, Correct. anything geared at increasing Correct. life expectancy already promises mega bucks. Dubious wonder drugs and IV drips are readily available. The region is also attracting biotech companies from around the world. Money from wealthy investors has created a much hyped startup scene. Longevity research is Hong Kong's new dot com boom. A new development is that the research is being carried out with business startup methods, with massive capital. We're investing, we're pumping funds into it, we're throwing cash at it, and that will invariably result in a product. It's an infallible economic model. It will always work. It's a market, it's a huge market. What these new companies want, really, is to have treatments for, for diseases. So that's where the, the big bucks are. I'm willing to experiment on myself because there is a lot of data on me. I'm one of the most well-studied humans on the planet now. And I try to optimize for high performance at this point in time. I try to perform at my peak. I've tried rapamycin in the past. It's very often referred to as uh, 
uh, a magic drug in longevity, in, uh, uh, in the same line as metformin, but likely to be stronger than metformin, it's not without side effects. So there is a chance that you're going to see mucositis and a few others. So we decided to try it on ourselves in a very controlled mode. Any side effects? Not at all. Uh, zero side effects. When I was exercising in the hotel, I, I, I got some serious muscle mass increases here. Oh, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, that's me. So that's for Vermeisen. Oh, thank you, my goodies. Thank you so much. All right. Come back. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers to long life, literally. To long life. <laughs>was interested in anti-aging science since I was a teenager growing up in Frankfurt, Germany. I had a group of friends who were very interested in science. And at some point we realized the most important challenge of our generation is to prolong life. We had very lofty goals, I need to tell you, you know, we had crazy goals. We wanted to study physics, math, biology, chemistry. Also, we wanted to do space travel. And then the minute you think of space travel, you realize that you will need decades, you know, to travel or centuries. And so we felt we really need to solve this problem first. Um, to extend our lifespan before we can even think about space travel. One day, by accident, really because I did somebody a favor, I analyzed these methylation data, I immediately recognized that epigenetics or methylation is really the data source that has a tremendous signal for aging. He was able to find clusters of genes whose methylation state could tell you how old you were at a particular time. The amazing thing about this is that it works from the day you're created as a fertilized egg cell all the way until the day that you die. There are more than 200 distinct cell types in the human body. Although they all contain the same DNA, there is a mechanism that tells the cell whether it is a skin cell or a liver cell, for example. Called epigenetics, this involves information that sits on the DNA, resulting in genes being switched on or off. Perhaps the best known type of epigenetic change is methylation, the addition or removal of methyl groups on the DNA strand. These changes continue to take place throughout our lives. The DNA contains four letters, A, C, T, G. Methylation sometimes attaches to the letter C and modifies it, similar to an umlaut. By keeping track very carefully which parts of the DNA gain methylation or lose methylation, we can measure aging. Methylation can be thought of like the rust that accumulates. By measuring the amount of rust, we can determine age. So if we have an hourglass, the passage of time is measured by how the sand, how much sand accumulates at the bottom. The DNA molecule, though, has 28 million different hourglasses because we have 28 million letters C in our DNA. So by averaging the measurements of 28 million hourglasses, you arrive at a very accurate measure of age. This is one of the most insightful discoveries in the history of mankind. Like the invention of the wheel. 
that definitely was a turning point in aging. I think that was just a very, a very, very important point where we were like, hey, we can measure aging now. The epigenetic clock has revolutionized research into aging. With a simple DNA sample, anyone's biological age can be determined. However, that can produce some nasty surprises. My name is Marcus Horvath, and I'm Steve's identical twin brother. He's my older twin brother. He's five minutes older than me. However, only at birth. We measured our epigenetic clock a couple of years ago. And then according to one of the clocks, I was actually four years older than him, <laughs> which is not necessarily good news. Those uh, technologies are enabling us to accelerate aging research dramatically by not waiting until you die. We can now measure where you are in life and measure how different interventions affect that prediction. We picked this up and applied AI to the same problem and developed many, many aging clocks. Above all, the quest for eternal life requires personal biological data. The digital devices we use every day can provide mountains of it. Big data is currently one of the most promising approaches to cracking the aging code. Unlike conventional medicine, artificial intelligence can scour the data for hidden patterns to help prevent diseases from developing in the first place. This situation looks very similar to theft on the subway. Somebody pulled your wallet, and you don't know who. Every human on the train looks the same. They move, they move in different patterns. So you need to observe many, many of those theft scenarios in many subways globally to develop a really precise algorithm for catching a thief on the subway. And you train AI technologies to recognize those thieves uh, and predict uh, human behavior. And I think nowadays in advanced countries like mainland China, there are video monitoring techniques uh, that allow you automatically to recognize uh, the theft uh, movement. So it's very similar to recognizing those uh, proteins that misbehave during aging and cause trouble. Yeah, so what we're gonna do now, we're gonna solve a disease very quickly. We're gonna solve the Crohn's disease. AI is already poised to increase our life expectancy or so we're told. At the touch of a button, startups can run through thousands of possible outcomes and quickly discover new medications. All based on data from users of apps like the one that Alex Zhavoronkov has developed. We recently received $255 million from a group of ultra-elite investors. So it turned out that we are in the right place in the right time with the right technology. I think that very soon we will see guys like Amazon. I'm waiting for these guys to react. Guys like uh, Facebook, uh, guys that produce video games, Netflix, those people who steal your time, they will come back and uh, try to figure out how to make more time so you can waste it on their product. Silicon Valley is already on board. In 2013, Google founded a secretive biotech venture called Calico. Its longevity research is carried out behind closed doors with nearly unlimited resources. A group backed by Amazon founder Jeff Bezos has also burst onto the anti-aging scene with hundreds of millions in funding, 
Alto's Labs is recruiting top scientists from around the globe to join the project. They include Steve Horvath and Manuel Serrano. There's even a longevity clinic in the pipeline. Despite the big players jockeying for position, there are still opportunities for smaller projects, like startup Bioteen, which is working flat out to develop a self-test to measure aging. Bioteen is a group of people who are working towards the goal of extending health span and eradicating aging-related diseases. We're all just sort of a group of people with a sort of a fascination for aging with diseases and aging itself. We have sort of focused on this idea of biological age itself. We tell you what your biological age is in sort of an accessible and cheap manner. Um, a lot of biological age tests currently are very pricey, which is fine. I mean, it makes total sense, especially for biohackers and people who are way more interested in the very deep science of aging, but we just want to give a general encapsulation of your aging process for the general population. Nina's clock is designed to determine age based on proteins in saliva. Although she can only work in a lab once she turns 16, she's found ways to access the latest data. You know, go to research paper website and they have supplementary files that we were able to download and see their data. So that's really cool. Sometimes when it comes to us working directly with labs, they send us the data personally. So they tell us here is the work we have done because it often helps them too in their projects. You know, people like Nina are taking advantage of a new paradigm really in which you can process the data on your own. Data is available. My lab does that. Um, on the one hand, I download data, but I also upload a lot of data. I, I put millions of dollars worth of data into the public domain. I think it's cool, yeah. <laughs> I think it's very cool. Actually, I know you were making some progress on the image of the test recently, and we sort of have a good rendering. And did you want to um, share your screen and show what that might look like? Yeah, I'll just do that right now. Um, hold on. Basically, right now, I think what we decided was the best way is like having a multi-panel test with each corresponding to one protein. We're using the same technology used in pregnancy tests, so I think that's pretty interesting. You spit on the test in the sampled area. Then from there, you downloaded sort of our app, and um, from there, you're able to find out, you know, the ratios of your control to sort of um, your protein lines. So what, what is sort of the concentration of these proteins and based on the color of this test? So, you know, you scan this, you find out that information, you enter it into our website, and you can find out a lot more about your aging process. We would want to do a subscription based. You know, you're going to get several tests a year because, you know, it's slowly going to get better as, you know, as you improve too. So it'll be really cool. <laughs> it would be very hard to conceive even wanting to do that for me. And I'm, I don't think anybody here is going to sign up for it. In contrast to Nina, Anna Gail Glenn in Costa Rica has already ended her professional life. A successful swimwear designer, she was able to retire at age 50. Ever since, she's been involved in a range of social projects. It's about being unified. It's about to participate and be of service. You know, do what you can care for yourself, but do what you can to care for others as well. And hopefully you get to a point in life where your basic needs are being met well enough that you have plenty of time to care for others. It boils down to the question, you know, do I, do I save myself or do I save my community? And really, if your community doesn't survive, what kind of life are you going to have? A couple of years ago, a law was passed to protect the longevos or the centenarians of the area that we live in, which is considered a legal blue zone. Legal, you know, by law in Costa Rica. So that's new. Nicoya is preparing for an increasing number of centenarians. A private initiative aims to raise funds to build the region's first nursing home. Rapid advances in longevity research are prompting a rethink of existing social structures. 
What will our lives look like if we continue to grow older and older? The centenarians did their contribution. Now it's somebody else's turn to take care of them. Hola, buenos dias, Don Nicolás. Buenos dias. Le traigo dos abogados. When we visit the Longevos, you ask them, how do you feel about this project we're doing? I'm going to be 103. That's great. But when you get old, you eventually need some help. You're lucky to live with your daughter who looks after you. There are people who have no support or no family. Yes, I feel happy to have lived such a long life. My friends and family are here. I want to live as long as God wants me to. Not more. As time has evolved being here and observing the people who live in this blue zone, I realize how connected they are. The social component is very important. They don't get cut off. Today we know that being part of a strong community is a life extending. That's a way for anyone to grow older, without turning to pills and injections that alter our DNA. Well, in my personal opinion, uh, I would not waste time on Blue Zones. We need to fix the problem of aging right here, right now. We've reached the point of evolution where we need to accelerate evolution ourselves. To do this, we need to evolve and we need to change as humans as well. Nature has no plan. Nature is a random thing, right? But it works. Nature has built up life on this planet over the last four and a half billion years, and it has fine-tuned and honed and optimized things to an unbelievable degree of perfection. So you have to be a little bit careful about messing with Mother Nature. One of the interesting things about super centenarians and centenarians is that their immune systems last much better than the rest of us which is a clue as to the fact that you need to have a good immune system in order to stay alive a long time. Steve Horvath is one of the scientists set to follow the call of Amazon boss Jeff Bezos. But before he embarks on that new task, he's focusing on another promising project. It's the so-called TRIM trial, designed by his colleague, Greg Fahey, to reverse immune system aging. Hardly any other study in the field has prompted as much interest in recent times. The flow of immune cells plays a central role in fighting illness in our bodies, but there's a limited supply of these essential cells. Our body's thymus gland produces T cells, the superstars of the adaptive immune system. However, once we reach puberty, the thymus begins to shrink. It is replaced by fatty tissue and eventually stops producing new T cells. Once we've used them up, our bodies become more susceptible to pathogens and to age-related diseases like cancer, stroke, and dementia. When I saw that you could use growth hormone to regrow the thymus and take immune system function that was down to about 20% of young immune system function, all the way back up to 100% of youthful function. I just thought we have to do something about this, but nobody took any action. So I did an experiment on myself and I regrew my own thymus. He published a scientific paper that described one person and that was himself. <laughs> 
In 2016, the trial was repeated. This time, a total of nine test subjects renewed their thymus. Fei suspected the treatment was having a positive effect on the whole body. But how could he prove it? This person came to me and said, can't you help me to analyze a treatment? And the minute he said the word thymus rejuvenation, I already said yes, you know. <laughs> Steve Horvath compared blood samples from the test subjects before and after treatment. And he was just as amazed, if not more amazed, as we were about the results. If they are confirmed, it will be a sensation. The original intention was get rid of the fat of the thymus. This treatment had a side effect, an unexpected side effect. It really rejuvenated the methylation, the epigenetic clock. All nine test subjects turned their epigenetic clocks back by around 18 months in a year of treatment. That means they had essentially reversed their biological age by two and a half years. We began to get reports from some of the people in the trial that I feel great, you know, I feel so energetic now. I feel my mind is working faster than it's worked before. Before this trial was over, this volunteer says, you know, my, my wife has been telling me that my hair is growing in dark again. And I said, really? I, that's interesting. Let's have a look. So we looked at his hair, and boy, it was a big, very strong difference. His hair was darkening all over the place. I need to say we are all very excited about it. But we are also very sober scientists, you know, and therefore we always felt we desperately need a second validation study. And that's really why I continue to work with Greg, why I become a study participant. A third study with more test subjects aims to corroborate the original results. If successful, Thymus regeneration could be the first scientifically proven anti-aging treatment for human beings. But the scientists need more data. Steve Horvath and his brother have volunteered to take part in the trial. As identical twins, they are ideal candidates. Steve will get the rejuvenation treatment, and Marcus will join the control group. We're now ready for your baseline testing, and, and this is the, the testing that you do before entering the Trimex trial, and then we'll assess you after 12 months of treatment and see how you fare at that point. The first step is a functional test, where you're literally just standing up and sitting back down as many times as you can within 30 seconds. And he so has outperformed me in the entire life, ever since we oh, were small at all. Yeah. No, yeah. I had a better <laughs> breakfast. I think. Maybe so. after 12 months of, of the trim treatment, you'll be able to compete with that. Mm -hmm. All right. And I'll give you a countdown. OK. On your mark. Get set. Go. <laughs> That's it. Oh. <laughs> I feel it in my, in my thighs. <laughs> now that we have your blood pumping, we're going to looking at your epigenetic clock. Okay. Perfect. Right. And then. Eighty women and men of different ages are taking part in the latest thymus study. And the treatment's inventor also hopes to rejuvenate himself once again. So I can't wait any longer, right? I'm getting older, I don't want to age, but I'm 71. I don't know how old I will be. Uh, that's an open question. Uh, I hope uh, longer than usual. Uh, that's all I can say at this point. The main component of the treatment is a growth hormone. To counteract certain side effects, the steroid hormone DHEA and the diabetes drug metformin are also added. Down the hatch. <laughs> I think about this future of biotechnology and 
changing the composition of our bodies, mm, it worries me. My dream is that there will be an intervention against aging if we are lucky in five years, in 10 years. And then people go to their annual checkup. The doctor says, you know what? You're aging a little bit too fast. Why don't you take this pill? That's the dream. So we are now building the toolkit, many enabling technologies that need to converge. And we need several more technologies to come to life in order for us to make a major leap. In terms of longevity for everyone, I think we are 25 years away. The development of an anti-aging wonder drug raises issues that threaten the foundations of our natural and social order. What will our planet look like if we live to be ever older? Would overpopulation make our ecosystems and social systems collapse? How can longevity be in harmony with the natural world and human civilization? Our lifestyle is expensive. It consumes resources. It creates overpopulation. This is true. When we were living very short, life didn't have such a value and also would not care so much for nature or for anything. So maybe it's not bad that we live longer because then we would care more about our planet and our environment and the lives of the, the rest of the, of the beings in this planet. <laughs>